Hi, everybody. My name is Ashish Jha, and I am the Dean of the School of Public Health at Brown University. And previously, I served as the COVID coordinator uh, for President Biden at the White House. Uh, welcome to World Med School. Uh, today's lecture is on MPOX, previously known as MS Monkeypox, and the impact the MPOX outbreak has had here in the United States. Uh, so MPOX is a, is a virus, uh, the monkeypox virus, uh, that has been endemic uh, largely to the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, but other parts of Africa as well, but largely in the DRC. Um, in 2022, we saw something very different for the first time. Um, while cases of MPOX had sporadically shown up in Europe and in the United States, um, they had been few uh, intermittent and rarely sustained, meaning you'd see a few cases and then it would sort of peter out. In 2022, we saw something very different. Uh, we saw the rise of a subtype of MPOX clay 2B. It's as it's called their MPOX is broken up into different clades. Uh, clay 2B uh, was the one that caused a major international outbreak leading to a public health emergency of international concern. When we look at clay 2B, the first hint that there may be something going on with this virus uh, that is different is an outbreak that happens in 2017 in Nigeria, um, where we see for the first time really evidence of sexual transmission of this virus. Most of the times we had thought it spread largely through touching and through direct contact with animals. And then in early 2022, and I, I think there is a period of lull, largely because of the COVID pandemic, there's very little international travel from late 2019 through 2022, uh, early 22. In, in mid-May of 2022, you see for the first time new cases arriving in the United Kingdom. Uh, the first cases arrived in early May from travelers who had traveled uh, to Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, May 17th of 2022, you see the first case arrive in the United States, also of a traveler. Um, but what is interesting is at that moment, this it wasn't clear that this was going to end up being any different than previous outbreaks, which had come in from travelers. But very rapidly, we saw, again, I'm going to focus really now on the United States. Very rapidly, we saw a large explosion of cases here in the United States. Um, so I want to walk you through a little bit of what happened in the first couple of months, not just because it's interesting about MPOX, but it also teaches us about how to think about outbreaks more broadly and how one should respond to outbreaks. Um, so it, again, in late May uh, of 2022, the first cases arrived. Within days, we start seeing a few more cases here, a few more cases there, initially almost all in travelers. Then we start seeing evidence of people with MPOX who are not travelers. And what that means is we are starting to get community spread. What that means is it is spreading from person to person inside the United States. That's very important because it's no longer a travel related disease. Now it is a disease that is spreading internally. So the key question is how do you respond to an outbreak of any kind? And I always say there are sort of three or four key principles you always want to think about anytime you're out responding to an outbreak. First, you need some sort of a surveillance and diagnostic strategy. How are you going to diagnose the disease? How do you make testing widely available and easy? Second, uh, outbreaks happen when people don't have immunity to a virus. And we knew people did not have a lot of immunity to the MPOX virus, largely because we haven't seen much MPOX. There is some uh, overlap in immunity to smallpox, but thankfully smallpox has been eradicated. And so nobody who's younger has any immunity to smallpox. And so we knew we had a very vulnerable population. So one of the key questions always is, how do you build up immunity as another way uh, to prevent the spread of this virus or certainly to uh, reduce its impact? Third question always is, what about treatments for people who are going to get infected? Do you have a strategy on treatment? And then last but certainly not least is the issue of communication. Anytime there's a new outbreak, there's also an outbreak of bad information. There is a need for good information. And so those things largely affected the U.S. response in the early days. Um, we did not have readily available, widely available testing. Uh, so a lot of the work that went in in the first month, six weeks of the outbreak was making testing widely available. Initially, the tests were only available through what are called public health labs. 
but in the couple of months after the first cases were identified and really after it became clear there was community transmission happening, um, it was became very, very important that testing just become much more widely available. So you could identify who has the virus and help isolate those people. As part of the surveillance work, again, staying on that first uh, issue, really important to know how the virus is spreading. In the early days of arrival here in the United States, arrival in the UK, arrival elsewhere, uh, it wasn't clear. And there was a lot of bad information about how this virus might spread. What became very clear through careful epidemiologic work, when, when we found cases, when you do the contact tracing, uh, et cetera, what, what became very, very clear was that the virus was spreading almost exclusively, not 100%, but almost exclusively through sexual activity, and it was spreading almost exclusively in the community of men who have sex with men. So largely gay and bisexual men who have sex with men. Though that epidemiology was very important, both for diagnostics, but it was also very helpful when thinking about the vaccine strategy, because there was a limited number of vaccines here in the United States uh, that, that were available for use. Uh, the vaccine that was used initially uh, was uh, a vaccine made by a company called Bavarian Nordic. The vaccine is called Genios. Um, and because there was a limited supply, largely because we had not seen a major mpox outbreak in the past, um, we could target the efforts to get this virus under control to the high-risk community. And the high-risk community was, again, uh, gay and bisexual men who have sex with men, primarily among people with multiple partners, because that was the group in which it was spreading. And so a lot of the work initially was, let's get that community, that population vaccinated as a way to protect them. And, and, and so that's the vaccine strategy. And then last but not least, when I talked about the communication, it was broad communication to the general public, that the risk for the general public was low. It was targeted communication to that to that community, uh, the the gay and bisexual men community, uh, that they were at elevated risk, especially if they had multiple partners, and that they needed to get vaccinated in other ways that they could protect themselves. So that was the initial strategy. And what you see in the data, if you go to the CDC website and look at MPOX data, um, <clears throat> what you see is that there is initially a huge rise in cases as all of this work is being done. Um, as I said, the first case arrived in late in mid to late May. And by the end of July, cases peak, and you start seeing a very, very sharp decline. August 1st, I believe, was the peak day. You see a very sharp decline in cases as vaccinations roll out, uh, as testing becomes more widespread. And very quickly, you see the outbreak get under control here in the United States. So that's the history of what happened. Europe and other places uh, followed a similar pattern. So let's talk about what has happened in the intervening time and where we are today and what how to think about this. So in the intervening time, while many high-risk individuals got vaccinated, of course, not everybody uh, in the United States, particularly uh, men of color, African-Americans, Latinos, poor people, less likely to get vaccinated. And so what we've seen is very low levels of MPOX. Again, clade 2B, that's the version that has spread here in the United States and, and globally, continuing to spread in very, very low numbers. What do I mean by low numbers? Uh, at the peak, we were seeing as much as 3,000 cases per week. Over the last year, year and a half, it's been more like three or five cases or at most 10 cases a week. Um, very low numbers for a country the size of the United States. Okay, so that continues, but where are we today? So today there is now a new public health emergency of international concern over MPOX. Why is that? Uh, well, what is happening is you're seeing the spread of a new version of MPOX. It's not, a, it's not a new version in the sense that uh, it's a new virus, but a different version, clade one, and specifically clade one B, um, that, that has really taken over. We've seen a big increase in cases in the DRC, but also in neighboring countries, Burundi, Rwanda, uh, Uganda, other places as well. What you see with clade one B in, in Africa is it's again spread a lot through sexual networks, both gay and straight sexual networks. It's also spread through household contacts. Uh, we saw a little bit of that with 2B, the original one from, from a few years ago, but we're seeing more of that now. And when you see that, you tend to see more children getting infected because they may be in the household of people who were previously infected. And 
we're just starting to see cases from Africa also because of travel uh, land in other places. So we've had now a case in Sweden uh, of, of clade 1B. We've had a case of uh, it in Thailand. And one would not be surprised if we see more of these in the days and weeks ahead. Um, so what's the plan inside the United States? Well, the assumption is that this clade 1B will also arrive here. One of the lessons we learned from COVID is I think it's something that we all should understand is whenever there's an outbreak in one place, if it goes on for any extended period of time, because how globalized travel has become, you will see cases of almost every infection spread to other parts of the world. That's happening here with clade 1B. <clears throat> so if you go back to first principles that I talked about with how we manage clade 2B, it becomes the same thing. Let's make sure there's plenty of testing available so we can identify when someone shows up with a clade 1B, a new, the, the different version of MPOX. Uh, let's make sure that we have a strategy on treatment. Um, there is one therapy that has been used for clade 2B. It's called TPOX. We don't know to what extent it works for 1B. That needs to be tested and studied. Third, making sure vaccines are widely available. To the extent that it affects the same community, gay and bisexual men who have sex with men, a lot of those people are going to have immunity from clade 2B and should be more protected. But many of those men did not end up getting vaccinated the first time and they're vulnerable. But to the extent that this new version of the virus spreads in other communities among heterosexual people, for instance, obviously thinking about what is the strategy for vaccinating that much larger population will be very, very important. So testing, treatments, vaccines, and then I talked already about the importance of communication. Um, a really important part of the strategy right now is got to be communicating with the general public about how the risk is relatively low, but we have to pay close attention and we have to identify uh, these cases. Let me wrap up now by really just talking about the long-term thinking about MPOX. Uh, this is a virus, again, that has been around for a long time, has caused a lot of misery, a lot of illness, a lot of deaths in the DRC the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as some in neighboring countries, we need a long-term strategy for managing this virus. And in my view, that means a sustained effort to vaccinate a large proportion of the, of the at-risk population in the DRC and in neighboring countries. Um, otherwise, we're going to continue to see flare-ups of this virus. Uh, so I think helping those countries launch a vigorous vaccination program, making sure we have enough global supply of the vaccine. Right now, we have one company Genios, or sorry, Bavarian Nordic, that makes the Genios vaccine, that's not enough. We need more vaccines. There is a Japanese company that also makes a vaccine, but that has not had the same level of data. We need more vaccines of these type, and we need new vaccines as well. That's going to be important. Um, let me just wrap up by saying the truth is that while I focus most of my attention here on the United States, it's really important to remember that these outbreaks are global outbreaks. And if we really want to protect people around the world, focusing on the source of the outbreak, providing those countries with assistance, help, treatments, vaccines, is a critical part of controlling any outbreak. Mpox is no different. So uh, Mpox, a, a, a virus, a monkeypox virus that is, uh, uh, can be quite disabling, can be, can be deadly for some people. Um, we are at a point where we can manage it but it's going to take concerted effort to do so. And that has been the, the key lesson, both out of the 2022 outbreak and the outbreak we are seeing now. Um, thank you again for listening to this. I hope the conversation about MPOX was useful um, and have a great day.